Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The keynote speaker for today's occasion for Bonafide Foundation. Foundation. Family, with a round of applause, let's welcome Rabbi Kumin Alad. Thank you very much, Anna Bakesi, for the introduction. First, let me begin by giving all honor, yeah, praise, yeah. and glory to the Almighty, the one by whom we live, move, and have our being, and to the spirit of our great African ancestors, upon whose shoulders we stand, to our special guest of honor, Nana Duakwa, the fifth, to Nana Noon, to all of the distinguished guests that are here, to our priests and priestess, the Kemetic priests and priestess that is with us here today, Jabari and Dr. Kanika, and most of all, to our students and our young people that are here today. I greet you in the spirit of peace and love. I would like to thank our beloved headmistress for allowing the students to come out here today for this session because it gives great meaning and substance to be able to share with our young minds the information that's so vital we feel for the future of Africa because we are your future. What I mean by that, I know you most commonly hear that the youth are our future. But a very wise man told me some years back, and I've always reiterated that, that we are the future of our youth. In other words, what we do or fail to do to help you to prepare to continue the legacy makes a difference in how our future is handled. So we must make the investment in you, and we must be responsible to you in order for you to be prepared to be the future that we hope to be and set the foundation for. So I'm happy to see you here in this audience and your regal colors of purple and gold and along with the other youth that have joined and all of our guests that are here today, I'm very happy for this follow-up session. Just almost two weeks ago, we had a very inspiring session here that kind of gendered up all of our minds and spirit and soul towards the importance of a new movement to be able to share the kind of knowledge and wisdom and understanding that prepares us for our future. My topic today, and I'm not speaking alone, I am sharing today's podium with our beloved prophetic uh, priest and priestess whom I will leave sufficient time to be able to share with you. But the topic that I've been asked to speak on today as a follow-up is the meaning of the year of return. Of course, now we are in beyond the return. But I think once we're in beyond the return, the year of return came so fast that so many still miss what was the importance of the year of return. Well, let me first give a little bit of history on how this whole cliche and how this whole momentous and historic um, proclamation came about. Okay. Many of you have heard about the North Atlantic slave trade. We know that we are here in Cape Coast, as well as close to Elmina, where we have two edifices that are real landmarks to that infamous trade as it, is, as it is called. I will challenge some of those statements within my discourse of speaking. That is the Cape Coast and Elmina forts and dungeons, often called the Cape Coast and Elmina castles. And these are some of the most poignant evidences that this actual episode in history did take place. Now, 2019 was supposed to be the commemoration of the 400th year since the first Africans enslaved arrived in North America. 
And the reason why I say it that particular way because historians will certainly say that 1619 was not the first year the Africans were captured and enslaved were brought to the Americas. That this trade started much earlier than 1619. Even as early as the 15th century, in the 1400s, we have records of Portuguese taking Africans from West Africa to the so-called New World, the Western Hemisphere. But what was particular peculiar about that year is that how the United States of America has somehow, in that 400 years, and yet, if 400 years ago, now we have to say plus two, when those first Africans were taken there, the United States of America was no more than what we would consider a very enlarged continent, no more developed than what you might say, um, Kakum Park or any other uh, place around at that particular time. Now that's not taking away any respect to the natives who were there, who were very well accomplished in their societies and their social structures. But I'm just trying to put in perspective that today, the way our African youth and so many other people around the world are willing to risk their life across the high seas, across the Mediterranean, stowaways on ships across the Atlantic to get to America as if just touching that soil, soil would be some act of magic that would be transformed into a more affluent way of life. I want to put in perspective what was the history that made it that and how did that history affect Mother Africa? That 400 years was going to be commemorated by many Africans in America, commonly known as African Americans. There's a political body in the United States of America called the Congressional Black Caucus. And upon the anticipation of 2019 coming to date, they went to commemorate the 400 year anniversary of the landing of 20 and odd Africans on the White Lion ship in Jamestown, Virginia, which historians have correctly say Point Comfort, Virginia. And how that marked the beginning of what is today known as the African American community in the United States of America. And so upon that taking place, there were some of us here in Ghana, specifically those of us who have been celebrating the Panapest and Emancipation Day over a quarter of a century ago, who have been trying to reunite the African family, who have been trying to inaugurate the re-emergence of African civilization. We also recognize this historical landmark and began to make noise here in Ghana saying that we should make sure here in Ghana that we put out the clarion call here to call our sons and daughters, our brothers and sisters, back home to Mother Africa on this 400 year anniversary. There's some who took it even further, who know the Bible, and who understood Bible prophecy and said, there's somewhere in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, specifically in chapter 15, verse 13, that spoke about the children of God, the seed of Abraham, being taken away into a strange land, a foreign land, where they were served for 400 years, and after that 400 years, the nations where they had gone would be judged, and they themselves would be brought back to their own land of their forefathers. Putting all this conversation together, a committee was formed, a committee to commemorate that in Ghana. And we approached the president of the Republic of Ghana, His Excellency Nana Adodankwa Kupado, and asked the audience that we would get his endorsement to proclaim in Ghana the year of return to invite the sons and daughters of Africa who have been in the diaspora taken away against their will over 400 years ago to come back home. And because we knew that the General Assembly at the United Nations is usually called around September when all leaders of the world go to the UN and they give somewhat of a statement and state of affairs to the world as it pertains to their nation and where they are in the world and the message they want to give to the world body of leaders. We were asking if the president could take that opportunity to take a trip to Washington, D.C. to meet with the Congressional Black Caucus and ask them to invite all of their constituencies to come back home to Africa to commemorate that 400 years. Now, of course, some of us had a deep insight to understand the spiritual significance of this. 
So we didn't look at this as just a tourism gimmick. We realized that because of the lies that have been perpetrated against Africa, and the lies that have been perpetrated against Africans, that 400 years have created a large divide, even larger than the Atlantic Ocean can measure. And that it was a need for us to take another look at Mother Africa, and for Africa to take a look at itself. And that the spiritual journey needed to take place, that Africans come together again and unite themselves. And that that family union needs to take place on the African continent. And if we can get enough Africans to agree to take the trip back to Mother Africa, we have the confidence and the spirit of our ancestors that they will be touched and see Mother Africa outside the stereotype that Africa was a land just full of disease, just full of wild animals, just full of a jungle, but see the rich potential that Mother Africa had, even through the devastation of having been robbed of millions of her sons and daughters, and even through the devastation of having been put, put under colonialism, and still under the dispensation of neo-colonialism, that Africa still had enough of its richness and its essence to be able to be developed if African people would return their mind back to developing Mother Africa. So it was with that convincing argument that the president did take a trip to the U.S. and then took a trip to Washington, D.C. and then had an inaugural proclamation proclaiming in October of 2018 the year of return. And as a result, as a result of that proclamation, thousands of Africans came from all over the United States, came from all over the Americas, meaning North America, South America, the Caribbean, Europe, Central America, to come back to Africa. Many didn't even know what they were coming back to. It began to be swelled and grow and enlarge so large that even those who, of us who were planning didn't realize the magnitude of that response. And so there was not even a full preparation of a program to receive all of those that came. I put in, I'm saying all that to put in perspective this same year of return. Because for some of us, we didn't believe that the year of return or the term return was relative to just taking an airplane trip back to Mother Africa and landing at Katoka International Airport. Some of us, it didn't mean just taking a trip and crossing one of our land borders. Or taking a trip and coming to port at the sea. To some of us, we knew that the term return had a more spiritual significance because many of us, as Africans, very few of us, have escaped our journey away from Mother Africa and her center and her soul. What do I mean by that? After so many years of the rape and the robbing of Mother Africa of her sons and daughters, which is her greatest resource being robbed from her, and after so many years of Mother Africa having been exploited with colonialism, we realized that the African mind had been taken out of the African. That the colonial mind had set in, not only with the Africans abroad, who were forced to give up their names, their language, their culture, but many Africans on the continent too, and especially our leadership, found ourselves chasing European values, European models, and Europeans as if they were standing for excellence as if they were standing for progress, as if they were standing for progression. And we realized that we had done that at the cost of not appreciating the wealth and the worth of our African self. That what has set into the African mind and the African character through exploitation, we were judging that as if that was African culture. So every time you see corruption, in a government on the continent of Africa, we say, you see the African. When someone lies to you and they want to take a pride, you say, you see the African. When you see underdevelopment, and you see underachievement, when you see a compromise for excellence, you say, you see the African. You see the black man. In other words, we have lost the knowledge of ourselves, we have lost the sense of ourselves, we have lost the vision of ourselves, and now we judge ourselves in this dilapidated sense of what someone else's vision of us is and what we've accepted. <clears throat> we even accept the position of believing that we're poor. 
So because someone has wrote a script and told us that we're poor, we act like we're poor. We go around begging, not just children. We have leaders begging. We have adults begging. We have children begging because somebody told us we're poor. Everybody in the world sees that Africa is rich. Africa is one of the richest continents in the world. With all the prayers that Africans do every day, and all the churches, and all the mosques, and all the shrines, and all the temples, begging God to bless us, we blind ourselves to God having given us the biggest blessing and endowment of any other race on the face of this earth. We don't appreciate what God has done. I've often said, not being blessed at us, but if I was God, I would slap everybody that got down the prayer and ask me for anything else. Being ungrateful for what I've given you. I've given you more than I've given anybody. And you're on your knees asking me for more, and you haven't used what I've given you? Not only in the material wealth of our land, of our rivers, of our landscape, of the blue skies and the sunshine, but no human being on this earth is endowed with more human endowment and enrichment than the African. We have the greatest endowment and capacity of mind. We have the greatest endowment and capacity of spirit. We have the greatest endowment and capacity in our physical form and our body. So what else can we ask God for? Other than to wake us up in the morning and do something with what he's given us. But as long as our mind has been robbed from us and we've been seen, been trained and been educated to see ourselves in the image outside of ourselves, we'll be lost. So for some of us, the return was a plea that we can return back to the knowledge of ourselves. Return back to our own center of putting wealth on being an African. Return back to the center of our own soul of saying that you feel blessed to be an African. Not that you were cursed. Not that you would have to spend money on a cosmetic cream trying to make yourself white. Not that you saying money, spend money on cosmetics trying to change the texture of your hair. Not that you would spend money on fashion and form trying to look like somebody else's culture and taking off your own culture and not having pride in your own culture. Look at the brilliance of our chiefs and our animals. Look at these colors. Look at the skills that it takes to weave this cloth. Look at the endowment of the symbols in there and the meaning of the indigo symbols. Who has a culture that rich? Who has an endowment that rich? But when your mind is robbed from you and you have no memory of who you are, you are blind to what it is that you have. And we must take off those shackles from our eyes and begin to see value and beauty in ourselves. I came through an era of the 60s and the 70s when I was a student like you. And we would send great men and great women to try to wake us up from our sleep and our slumber. Because many black people in America, we hated Africa. When we were told we're from Africa, like somebody cursed us. They said, don't tell me I'm not from Africa. Because Africa like they were cursed. Someone called you black, you were written black. Don't call me black, I'm not black. Because someone had just cursed you. But then because God put a spirit of awakening on us, and we called it black empowerment, we had our artists that began to make songs, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. We began to have artists to make songs about sweet songs about Mother Africa and the beauty of Mother Africa. We started making dashikis. We even started taking the curtains off of our mother's living room and sewing it to make dashikis to get a material that had a print to it. We started making sandals. We started thinking about Mother Africa again. We started having pride in ourselves to wake us up. And so people got nervous with that. Talking about Africa. Africa started going through the independence movement herself in the year 1960, three years after Ghana found her freedom, but the same year that Ghana became a republic. 30 African nations threw up colonial rule. 30 African nations said they didn't want to be under colonialism no more. They didn't want to be under Europeans no more. Just in 1960. But people got worried. That was just the beginning of a march towards liberation. That was the beginning of a march towards true emancipation and liberation. But that was an, it was an interruption. We didn't finish. Signing a piece of paper and legislation saying we're an independent nation was not enough. 
making our own flag, having the songs to write our own anthem, making our own pledge of allegiance, it was not enough. We had to be able to go into all the millions of Africans on the African continent and away from the African continent and go inside the mind of the Africans to reshape our minds back and to be Africans all over again. Because just like you were made to take on a European name in order to be able to go to church or register to school, it wasn't just the European name you had to take on because they said Kojo wasn't good enough, you had to be kidding. Omaja wasn't good enough, you had to be married. It wasn't just a name, it was changing your mind to begin you to be a part of a process that would Europeanize you. So in order to be African in our value and our work, we also need another process to reclaim our identity and reclaim our value. We can't have a full liberation and emancipation struggle without liberating the mind. In fact, that's what freedom means. Free means to liberate. And dome means there was meal in the corner over there. And you train that dog to stay in the yard and don't go train to be black people. Black is not a nation. Black is not an ethnic group. Black is not an identity. Negro is neither the same, but under colonialism and slavery, they remade us into a new people. People outside don't know what a Fanti is. People outside don't know what a Shanti is. They don't know what that way is, a Yoruba is, a Igbo is. They don't know anything. They just know African. And the world just learned that there's Africans and Africans and dark continents and jungle. They didn't respect our culture. They didn't respect our language. They never know that we're people. So we just look at ourselves. If you don't speak my language, if you don't come from my village, then you're not like me. The Europeans saw that division and he capitalized on that division and he, he, he drove a train for that and why those divisions even grow. But when we talk about today, kind of Africanism, it's a word that many of us don't understand. Pan Africanism has to be an ideology of African people thinking together as a people, working to solve our problems together as a people and believing in ourselves as a people and putting worth and value back in ourselves as a people. And we can't do that if we don't have no problem lying to each other, cheating each other, holding mediocrity as a standard of being African that cannot work for us to be liberated as a people. So when we talk about the year of return or beyond the return, we're talking about a journey back into what it is to be African. Now, I have some books on my table, and I know what we're guessing is that you're gonna understand this if you leave, that it ain't gonna happen like that. <laughs> I just want to stir up our minds that when we had these great leaders and thinkers who've been sent to us, who've been struggling since the day we found ourselves in a struggle, many of them took time to write about our conditions, and the possible solution. Some of these authors and some of these books are unknown to us. And I simply wanted to just introduce some topics, but as students, because I realize some students are gonna be here, I wanted you to actually see that there's some physical books that are available, that you can actually read research. Don't blame it on your teacher and your school if you don't have this book I haven't read or you haven't learned your history. Because I don't know a teenager today that doesn't have a cell phone, doesn't have access to social media, and cannot look up stuff. But where do we put our attention when we Google something today? Are we Googling about our history? Are we Googling about the knowledge of ourselves? I want to paint a picture. In the 14th century, and Europeans began to travel down here to Africa, I want to talk about a scenario. I said that people told us we are poor, and we act out the part as if we are poor. And they don't remind us of our riches. See, if someone told you you was rich, and you didn't have no money, you'd be, you got one or two questions. You say, wait, what is that person talking about? Or, where is my money? Because they say I'm rich, they must know something I don't know. <laughs> 
But I don't, I don't have no money in my pocket. And last I checked and cleaned up my room, I didn't see no hidden box in there with no money in it. So how can this person tell me that I'm rich and I have no money? But it means to ask the question because someone in the world kept telling the African, the Africans are rich, Africans are rich, and Africans are rich. Africans will start to ask the question, where's our money? And where's our riches? And you might end up coming to the conclusion, somebody must have robbed me. Because the last I seen, I can't find my money. So where's the thief? And where's the robber? Who took my money? So that picture I want to paint, how many of you have ever heard about a man called Mansa Musa? Somebody that says in our first session, but you students weren't here. How many of you have heard about Mansa Musa? Have you heard about a man called Mansa Musa? Raise your hand. One person. I'm talking to the students. We got, I, I understand from your head history, you history students. All right. This is the work we got to do. That's why I bring it up. Mansa Musa, most recently in the last two to three years, have been circulating all throughout social media, all over again. The reason why his name is circulating is because they he's the richest man that ever lived in history. They say he's richer than Bill Gates, richer than Donald Trump. Not the richest man of his time, not the richest man of yesterday, but the richest man of all. He was a king of Mali. You know a lot of the current day Ghanaians, you know the pedigree they say from ancient Ghana, Sunghai, Mali, all of these migrations come down. This is your history. This is who you are. Now can you imagine that your king was the richest king in all the world that ever lived till this day? And that he's famous because he took a pilgrimage from West Africa all the way to Mecca. He didn't fly. He went on the ground. He went with 60,000 men. 60,000. Out of that 60,000, they say 12,000 were servants. They even say slaves. But when they describe those slaves, the servants, they said when they came to town, they came in the finest brocade material and silk. 500 of those servants came in a procession like you saw the chiefs come in. They came in in single file, all of them having a golden staff, weighed no less than seven to eight pounds in gold. Real gold, fine gold. The finest gold that you can find in the world at that time. They would come, single file, 500 of them, before the rest of the entourage would come. And it said in all of that splendor, in all of that beauty, the writers of that day said what was more sparkling and splendid than the beauty of the material that they wore and the gold that they displayed was the character of their person. There were no arguments. There was no fight. There was no stealing. There was no looting. No on-the-side crimes. No on-the-side deals. The character was more valuable than the gold they had on the camels in that caravan. Now people come to Ghana and they go back and they say it was very beautiful, but you know what's most beautiful? The personality of the Ghanaian. The smile, the welcome, the hospitality. Meaning in all of those years of exploitation of slavery and colonialism, there's still that spark of character that's inside the Ghanaian personality. Even though all the years of the oppression, there's still something there to be nurtured and worked with. Now this is in the 14th century. This is somewhere around the year 1336, 1332, some say maybe around 1324. Now at that time, what was happening in Europe? One of the most significant pieces of news and information that came out of Europe at that time was the Black Plague. I didn't mean you and I now. There was a pandemic, a disease 
that killed an estimate of 150 to 200 million Europeans. Devastated their diseased and poor. Now, can you imagine a continent having over 150 to 200 million infected people? It makes the coronavirus seem like a sneeze. I'm giving you a picture of Africa in the 14th century in Europe. And every one of the people there, the Arabs in Europe. The story of Mansa Musa. Who was this man that had all this gold? Who was this man whose servants had staffs of gold? Who was this man whose slaves were dressed in brocade and silk? What kind of man was he? Where was he from? They say he's from Mali, from West Africa. What's the source of that gold? From Mali, from West Africa. That set every storyteller. That set every explorer wanted to find out the source of that gold. Where did that gold come from? So you had Europeans and Arabs alike wanted to come down to find out the source of gold in West Africa. So right here in Edna, Right here in Albania, Europeans came in the 15th century and searched for that gold. They wanted to find out what is the source. They still heard those stories about that gold. So they wanted to find that gold. I mean, it was so prevalent, they forgot the name of all the people in Ghana. They really didn't care about the name of the people in Ghana. They just said, as far as we're concerned, you are gold coastal. But what we're looking for is we're going to rename you. You don't care what your name is, your language is. You're Gold Coaster. You live where the gold is. So your name is Gold Coaster. Other Europeans came down here, went next door. They named the people after Elephant Tusk. Ivory Coaster. But Elephant's there, Ivory's there, so you're you going to be called after the Elephant. Ivory. Nigeria was called the Slave Coast for a while, and then they called it Nigger Area, which is Nigeria. That's right. Cameroon means shrimp. People in Cameroon were called shrimp, shrimp but the first white man saw shrimp bigger than they ever saw anywhere else in the world. So they called them shrimp area, Cameroon. Took away all the African identity and renamed all Africans so that our value was no more as human beings, we were valued as commodities. What was on our land? What riches can I get from that land? The people don't count. And if you think that I'm exaggerating, and for some reason maybe I don't like Europeans or something, look at America. When you look at America, do you think about the Native American? Do you think about that they were the people there? Do you think about the white man? That's the white man's land, the white man's governor. There were the people that lived there when he landed there. People that lived there. People whose land it was. But the same European wanted the land, but he didn't want the people. Australia had people there. Aboriginal people there. But Europeans wanted the land, but they didn't want the people. Even we had to have men from the so-called Gold Coast, from the rich culture of the true Ghanaians, had to go to England and plead there with the Aboriginal protection rights to say that we were a people and we had a land before the white man came here that helped save Ghana. Because they want the land but not the people. I'm saying that for you, your generation is going to have to fight the challenge. Because the European power and Western power and Asian powers are coming back to Africa. And they want the land but they don't want the people. And if you're not educated properly to understand where you're at in time in history, you end up again being servants and slaves in your own land with foreign powers coming here to develop Mother Africa, Mother Ghana to give you a job because you will not have the sight and the foresight and the preparation to say, we can do for self. If you want to come in and get a job, fine. But we don't need you to come here to make jobs. We can be industrious and make our own jobs for our own people so we can, and we can capitalize on our own wealth. So I want to paint that picture because when someone tells you that you don't have a name, that's what they told us in America, that you had no name that was worth remembering. So I'm giving you a new name. Jack Johnson, Willie James, Wilhelmina James, Michelle Obama, Michelle Johnson, 
Obama was the African name, but Michelle Johnson. See, no matter how high we reached in society, we were carrying somebody else's identity. And they told us that we had no identity. We had no name. But they do. If we had our name, we could trace ourselves back to our family house, back to our village, back to our land, back to our culture. So even here on the African continent, in order for you to benefit during colonial times, you had to take on a European name. They called it Christian name, but it wasn't Christian, it was European. But the Bible people were Hebrews. They didn't have Christian name, they had Hebrew names. And so in that respect, we all had to take on a new identity to satisfy our European so-called masters, who became masters of our faith. And they rob our memories. So you will subscribe and ask the question, how many of you know who Mansa Musa is? And you can't raise your hand. I don't really that. He started an organization called the UNIA, the United Negro Improvement Association. At that time, Negro was a dignified term to call us. Because the Europeans and the white man had called us nigger so much that even if we called the Negro was dignified. So he said the Universal Negro Improvement Association. He realized that after we've been enslaved for so many years, our condition was like the animals of the field, where we would cheat on one another, we would steal from one another, we argue and kill one another. So we need to improve our character in order to be able to stand on the stage with the rest of humanity. So he established this, we would teach each other, school each other, teach each other grooming principles. And he dreamed of doing business together and industry together so we can go back and fight to free Mother Africa, who at that time had not recently been, we just recently been divided up at the Berlin Conference in 1884. How many of you heard of the Berlin Conference in 1884? The Berlin Conference of 1884. That is the conference where Europeans met in Berlin, Germany. And they decided that Africa is so rich that all of us can enrich ourselves, but we shouldn't fight over and kill each other. Let's have a meeting and divide Africa amongst ourselves and respect those boundaries and share the wealth. So they literally sat down in a meeting for about two months and they drew lines across Africa and they drew boundaries. The English took some, the French took some, the Germans took some, the Spanish took some, the Portuguese took some. They all got a piece. That's why we speak English, French, Portuguese, Spanish, all the different foreign languages. Because whatever foreigner took over our territory, they made us speak their language and gave us their names. And they further divided the African family. So Marcus Mosiah Garvey decided that he was going to unite us under a black star. That's why Ghana has the black star in the flag. Because when Asaji called Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana, spent 17 years abroad, part of that was in the United States of America, and he came in contact with the teachings of the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey. He was inspired by those teachings, and he was upset that Marcus Garvey was betrayed, and that his ideas had been pushed to the background. And he said, if we ever get an independent state in Africa, we have to remember the dream of Ghana with the black star and the flag of Ghana. That's what that black star means, it represents. But guess what? The world leaders got together and said, we have to kill this man. This man cannot survive. He's making Africans come together. So they came together and trumped up charges and threw Gavi in jail. He stayed in jail for a number of years until they took him out of jail and deported him from the United States of America back to Jamaica so he could never come back to the United States again. Eventually, he died in London broken heart by himself. And his wife put together these writings of his so the world would not forget her husband. Amy Josh Dobby put together these works so today you as students and even I can read about this great man called Marcus Dobby. We have this book was written around 1923. We have another book here. This book is the African origin of civilization. It's written by Sheikh Antadia. We only got it in English around 1975, but the French got it in French around 1955. And because he was a Senegalese, he proved to the world 
that Africans were the first world. And everything you see in civilization today came from the Africans, the Africans had it first. That the Africans were the ones who built ancient Kemet, Egypt, not the Arabs, who are there now. That the Africans belong to ancient Ethiopia. Even the Africans colonized China. Africans first occupied Japan. The first civilization in China was the Chang Dynasty. African Kushites organized the Chinese into the first dynamic period and dynasty and still maintain that culture, African culture. The Japanese today, every Japanese home, they don't have a picture of no European Jesus in their home. They got an altar with their ancestors on it, like Africans do, but they made us ashamed of our ancestors. He wrote this book and documented it all. The African origin of civilization, myth or reality, because many of our scholars hitherto then, if he said Africans were the first in the world, people say that's the myth, that's a lie. He wanted to separate the myth from the lie, and he wrote this book, Sheikh Akadir. Then we have our very own, Asagi Ko, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, Revolutionary Path. He documented all of his movement towards revolution to pre Ghana. All of his major speeches, all of his major rallies, all of the conventions, the All African People's Convention, meetings of Africans all around the world, Africans from all around the world used to come to a prom, like it was Jerusalem, to hear the doctrine of revolution, to hear the doctrine of emancipation, to hear the doctrine of African freedom. But again, the world leaders got together and conspired and said he's too dangerous a man. If we have African unity, how can we, the Europeans, live? And what do I mean by that? Even one of the former presidents of France, President Jacques Chirac, said, that if France did not own her African colonies, and if France was not allowed to exploit Africa, France would be thrown into a third world country in 24 hours. A current French leader still siphoning the blood from Africa that they can't live without Mother Africa. And they know that. We don't know that. They make us think that we are a borrowing nation. It's like a thief come to your house and rob all your riches and you don't know who he is and you meet a man on the streets and you don't know he was a thief that came to you and you say, he say, it looks like you need something to eat. He did to them. And see, they think that we think like that. They think that we're going for revenge. They don't know whether we got forgiveness in our heart, compassion in our heart. You always carry that guilty conscience when they find out you did it. So we did not have to be in ignorance nor in the dark. These books are not just books, they're flashlights. So you can see in the dark where the light switch is. So you can turn on the light. This is your candle that you can read. Here's another African that discovered that we were the people of the book. He wrote a book, God, the Black Man and the Truth. Meaning they lied about God to us, lied about the black man, and lied about the truth. And we got to go back and research everything is that we've ever been told by these people that call themselves our saviors, but have been our oppressors. Then we have another book, very powerful book, The Destruction of Black Civilization. Twelve years ago, they discovered in Mali 100,000 manuscripts that they Overlooked. The reason why I say overlooked because they stole and ravaged all of our ancient cities and capitals and stole the information and brought it back to Europe. And then after the 10 years, they get a scholar to say he just discovered something. And what he did was remove the author from our books and put his name on it. And he said he discovered it, but the information was with the president of Senegal, Navasanjo, the president of Nigeria. They trusted the French. Our head of state to take those manuscripts to put them in a safe place for translation. Can you imagine that? 100,000 manuscripts in Africa, in Timbuktu, just 12 years ago, on mathematics, astronomy, science, medicine. They thought they had robbed everything from the place. They realized they had left that, and that evidence was there, and we were foolish enough to give it to them again for safekeeping. 
to prove the kind of mind that we had, the kind of development we had in the arts and sciences of civilization. We were the masters of the arts and sciences of civilization. We taught Europeans that just in caves coming down to ancient Kemet, Egypt, and Kush, Ethiopia. Become men of learning. And even that, they came at our feet when we were masters and they were just practitioners. That's why they only practice law. They never mastered it. That's why they only practice medicine. They never mastered it. They're practitioners. They're experimenting on us. We're the guinea pigs. So, in that respect, he documents over 6,000 years of Europeans trying to erase the history of the Africa. This book covers from 4,500 BC up to the year 2000. I'm saying this because sometimes when you talk like this, people say, what is he talking about? Where do you get that information from? He's lying. That's how we've been taught how to think. About 15 years ago, we were celebrating African History Month here in Ghana, and we had an exhibit at UCC. And we had a poster that was hanging with 50 inventions that Africans and Americans had invented in America. And I overheard the students speaking and said, well, these people only discovered this but they were mingling with the white man. If they haven't mingled with white men, then they could have discovered these things or accomplished these things. Fortunately, they said it to my hearing, and I interrupted them. I said, because you have no knowledge of who you are and who we are, you can make such an ignorant statement. We didn't go to the West to learn technology. We brought technology to the West. There was no developed America when the Africans were being taken away from here. Meanwhile, you, we had so many civilizations that we lost the memory of their number. We got civilizations that can surpass the intelligence of what you see today that we forgot they even ever existed. So we don't know who we were. We brought technology of the day from Africa to the Americas. There's no vocational schools that we went to before you began to be a slave. You got no training. So when you see and look at the history books, these little pieces of paper, they had posters when they were selling us, they changed your name, they say James, a carpenter, 19 years old. Wilhelmina Seamstress, 17 years old. They got George. He got, he's 22 years old, a blacksmith. Where did those skills come from? We had whole villages here that if you belong to a wood carving village, everybody in that village, from the grandfather to the little boy, can carve a school out of a single piece of wood. He can carve furniture. Till this day, they found that when they met us 500, 600 years ago. Smelting gold with gold treatments. They found that in us. Master Carpenter, we had built kingdoms while they were trying to build states. So we still have the art of building kingdom within our science, within our traditional systems that we are being taught is obsolete, should be marginalized while we adopt these foreign Western systems to govern ourselves. And so we have another book to address that by one of our very own. This is Nana Kobina and Kexia Dede. We wrote this book, African Culture in Governance and Development, the Ghana Paradigm. What do we mean by that? Why would we try to build our new societies based on European structures that don't work for them? But every black man and woman themselves. How can we say, look at America, look at we in Ghana. Look at UK, look at us in Ghana. You hear in America all the time. Look at America, look at us. America is two, United States of America is about 246 years old and they're trying to find out how to exact justice for all their citizens. The United States of America, 246 years old, and three months ago, they had these wild insurrectionists storm their capital because they weren't satisfied with the process of election. Three months after the election, the United States of America, some of the citizens in the state of Georgia, one of the most racist states in the union, have come up with more than 250 reforms in the voting system to stop people of color from voting. So you want that as your model? Mm. Or do you want to see a situation where our systems are examined so that whatever fault was with them, we fix it and move on to the future? 
and perfected. That's the African model for development. Not saying that we were perfect, but here it is that we got systems that have had 246 years to perfect itself, and there's an unwillingness to want to be perfected. But we still want to associate with it as if it's a model to want to follow. How can we use England as a model? Right now, you got poor people on the streets of England. You got homeless people on the streets of England. You got jobless people on the streets of England. Now here's a country that ruled through colonialism over Ghana, over Nigeria, over Gambia, over Egypt, over Jamaica, over all of these countries, over India, and all their resources. And they approach to that. They got homeless people. So find out where we went wrong. Find out what mistakes we made. And invest our time in perfecting that that our ancestors took thousands of years to develop and to evolve based on our spirit, based on the reality of our own experience. And invest time in what belongs to you and I. That is a subject matter worth studying. And then I have this book. This book is called When We Rule. Because some of us never think that we ever rule. We think that we always live in the village, in the bush. People say we're in the jungle. We got people who came here for the year of return and started crying because they thought that they would see people living in trees. They thought they would see people eating without fork and knife and no plates. They thought they'd see people living just, just in mud huts. They had no idea that, yes, we too, we have everything the world has. We have poor, rich, and everything in between. But what we have is our own. And this book documents all the civilizations before the Europeans came into their own global world power. See, we need a book of remembrance that we can remember that we had a past that was as glorious as anybody else's past. And this is why we know that the term return was more than a plane ride. It was more than landing at the airport. The return was returning back to the interest, the knowledge, and the science of who it is that we are ourselves. Because you can't return to something that you don't even remember. It's like you forget something when you go outside and you turn back in the house, maybe young people don't expect these old people know what I'm talking about. And you go back in the house and you forgot what you were looking for when you get in there. Then you gotta stand still in the before. You don't even know what you came back in the house for. You couldn't remember. Well, that is our state. When we say return, some of our people don't even remember what we're talking about returning to. So they return back to just having a good party, getting drunk, having a nice time, revelry and all of that. But they think that's the return. That's not the return. But in order to return back to ourselves, we have to understand what existed before it was destroyed. And then add value to that and see that that, seek, that is worth seeking. See, the word return uh, also is, has in the Bible, the word return means is shuva. And the Greeks in the New Testament turned that word return to repent. Repent has a connotation that it suggests that you left God and went astray. And it means return back to God, which is your center. That's what shuva means. It means literally in English, it means return. And hashuva means the return. But the return is like Sankofa. Go back and fetch it. Go back to the point that you went astray Fetch that essence, now go forward. Not back to go back. We're not talking about going back to the 14th century, 13th century, or BC. We're talking about we left something that's of value and worth. Let's take that thing and let it be the essence of how we go forward. So uh, with that, there's a whole lot to be said. But like I said the first time, we can't say it all in one piece, otherwise, you have a problem digesting it.
You see a buffet meal, you want everything there, but sometimes you can't eat everything there. You gotta take what you can eat. Otherwise, you leave food on the plate and you waste it. So, in that respect, I just want us, before I call on our beloved brother um, to give us also what he has to present, I want us to observe uh, standing one moment of silence for all the brothers and sisters that have lost their lives in the U.S. that are commemorated in the spirit of George Floyd since his trial, the trial the officer that killed him is on trial now and our people are seeking justice there. I want us in solidarity to observe one moment of silence that our ancestors in the spirit of Almighty God will hear our cry and our petition for justice. Thank you very much and for lending your ears and I hope that at least you gain something small to take back with you um, and you're happy to have you right here. Wow, now we do that better. A total soulish, spiritual, mental overhaul. And I think that is exactly what Rabbi is doing. And as I listened to him, of course, in the Bible, where the chronicle said that Moses now had to meet the children of Israel to tell them of what God wanted them to do. Deuteronomy chapter 6. The verse 6 says, this is what Moses said. 
And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And as Rabbi charged us, I felt he was talking to us individually. That today I'm standing here singularly and I want thousands of voices when I'm going. Charge your children to return. We are very grateful. Now there are a number of significant statements that Rabbi made that we are the future of our youth. It's quite interesting. That seems like a reversal of what we know. That we are the future of our youth. The investment we are making, no matter the acres of lands and other properties we buy, if you refuse to invest in our youth, when we are dead and gone, we will not have them to carry out any mantle. And for me, the books right on this table speaks volumes. What Rabbi was charging, check what is charging. you don't know much what you say? You want to check what I is charging? You know. seem to not have heard anything of you, but that. He's almost yeah. every hour of you is holding a phone. So what do you hear? When we open the books, what we read, when we get to the classroom, so what kind of conversations do we normally give ourselves to? Rabbi talked about the deception that had gone on for so long to the extent that everything African is bad, is negative, is black. To the extent that we seem to have the African enforcing or reinforcing these negativities. When somebody lies to say, you see the Ghanaian, you see the African. When somebody is giving you time, the person would have to now re-emphasize it. GMT, I'm not talking about Ghana man time. I said to you, clock. That's really sad. And this evening, I feel strongly that we are all being charged. Now, not because we say we are being ginged to return. And it's important for us to pick all these. Rabbi also said the year of return was more than people just coming from abroad and visiting tourism sites. He said the deception that went on was not just perpetrated to people in the diaspora, but people that were also left in this continent. And it is, it is a plea for us to go back, go back to pick the virtue that we have left as a people. That we are not as black as we are being made to believe. If we look at everything that is happening around us, we seem to be confused. We seem to have, have metamorphosed into something that we can't even describe ourselves. Return. And then, as he was getting close to the end of his remarks, he says, of all the years of oppression and looting of the continent, people come back to the continent to Ghana, and they leave with impressions of the Ghanaian hospitality. The smiles. It means that they did not completely succeed. It means that there is still a flicker of light for us to lift up and shine what is left tonight. And I believe that as students, as a people, this is a charge for us. We are not just going to keep it. The seeds have already been sown. We are going to water it. We are going to watch over them to germinate. And we are going to spread out for people to catch it. Rabbi, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Mrs. Amabawa. Uh, it's always so refreshing to hear from you. So we just watching uh, that you. So a very excellent uh, individual, uh, an example of uh, the African uh, woman with all the grace and uh, everything. Thank you, Hama. Family, we now are uh, going to hear from our guests who came all the way from New York to be part of this program. We are streaming live on Facebook, YouTube, wherever. Uh, I would like to apologize to our audience, mostly online, for the 
delay. You know, this we I think we are running almost an hour late, and uh, especially the president of uh, African Global Chamber of Commerce in Chicago, my brother Olivier Kumanzi. Uh, I'm sorry, I know you waiting to speak with us. We appreciate you, honor you. We will pray with you to be a little more patient with us. And uh, just to change us a little bit, I will now call on uh, the Associate Dance Institute. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, at this very moment, this is a very solemn moment, we are going back to our own selves. We are going to hear from two wonderful individuals from New York, from the Strand of my heart, Harlem, New York. They are going to share with us committed how we committed science of our garden. How we used to live as a people back then. They are going to share with us our spirituality, who we were before, when we built all this wonderful civilization. Now, I introduce to you Dr. Anika Jabari, and Mr. Jabari Osazi, wonderful couple, all the way from New York. Thank you so much, Madasi. I would like to begin by thanking the Divine Mother, Father, Creator, for allowing me to grace the grace to see another day. The ancestors for guiding my purpose. Thank you to all of the elders here and the Nana Nun, particularly Nana Obakesi Ampat, the first Abajahen of this great state of Asebu, Nana Kramana Kra, the second, and Nana Kotwo Eduokwa, the fifth, our chief of the wonderful village of Atonkwa. We have been welcomed here today, and we're so blessed to be able to talk to all of you today. As the co-chief priest of the Shrine of Ma'at, I am honored to be here among such distinguished guests. My full name is Hemet and Sir and Kathy, also known as Dr. Ika Daniels Osaze. And at this time, I don't know how I follow Rabbi Kofun, especially after he borrowed most of my speech. 
Just kidding. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking too <laughs> But I will say that the message is very similar. What is the meaning of the return? The return is an opportunity to rebuild our relationships across the diaspora. For too long, we have allowed outsiders to determine our destiny. We have allowed colonizers to dictate how we live, how we work, how we socialize amongst each other, and how we worship with each other. The return has reminded us that our families must be prepared, that we must not only see the return as a physical manifestation of our connection, but also a mental and spiritual one. We must do what our ancestors would be proud of, which is to become whole again, to embrace our identity, to not only have strong self-esteem, but even stronger race esteem. Love of who you are, love of who we are. You can't truly have powerful self-esteem without positive race esteem. We must also work together across the diaspora to be economically self-sufficient as a people once again, to conduct business together, to support one another, to view ourselves as one African people with many beautiful African cultures and traditions, as an with their career development. I am excited and encouraged to see so many young people here. It is important for you to witness the unity amongst diasporic Africans and to, a, and to be a part of this journey. I look forward to assisting with the development of Obakesi University of Excellence and supporting the Cape Coast Technical University Skills Training Program. As a linguist, I understand the importance of the need to return to our original languages in order to rebuild our communication with each other. But even more so as a priest, I know that we must return to our original spiritual traditions to strengthen our soul. That is why I began this speech, by acknowledging the divine mother. Don't be afraid to call on your ancestors. We've been made to believe in our own. We need to honor them, recognize them, and realize that we are that we still have work to do. We need to complete the unfinished works. We need to continue our connection as a people across the African. Commitment, a spiritual connection, and a plan. All things are possible. As we say in our Kemetic tradition, and I will say it in the language of our ancestors and repeat it to you is it a, is in the unfortunate language that I speak yeah. of English. Is it not so bad? I'm a suing pa and ted. Sao tsu and it's ra and pa and ted. Ao tsu, ao ra, maketi pa, heru ra. Those are the words of our comedic ancestors. And what I have just said was. Give yourself to the one most high. Keep yourself daily for the divine. And do it tomorrow just as you did it today. Swallow winter. Thank you to the divine Mother, Father, Creator. And thank you to all of you. Madasi. Madasi. I need to truly say thank you. Say, Bwa to my wife. The Co-chief priestess at the shrine of the shrine of Mahat, and uh, I have been told. I knew that there were students that were coming to speak to us, but I've been told that they are his, history students. Yes. So they are in the tradition that is truly the tradition that calls my heart to sing. So I am not going to stand behind the table. I'm going to come a little closer to you. Is that okay? I'm going to come a little closer, talk a little bit more intimately to you. Because I must say that history is so important because it helps us understand where we've been so we can understand where we need to go. 
And so I want to salute you for studying history. I know that all of these amazing guests who my wife has thanked so aptly are so pleased that you are studying your history because we know that with a proper understanding of who you are, we're not going to just say Ghana will do amazing things. We are going to say our people, the worldwide continent of Africans, will do amazing things. And it will begin here. And so please give yourselves a hand for this. Now, I want to also say greetings to you. And I know that as I walk around Ghana, a place that is rapidly becoming my second home, I absolutely hear people say Akwaba to me. And when they say it, they look at me because they want me to know that they see me. That they recognize me even though they've never seen me. That is not something that easily happens in places outside of our motherland, outside of the continent of Africa. You feel warmed when people, your people, recognize you and welcome you. I also want to give you another phrase of welcoming, one that's even older. A phrase of welcoming that I'm sure that those people who gave birth to the people, who gave birth to the people, who gave birth to the people, who, let's go a little further, gave birth to us, actually would have known. And I'm going to say to you though, that term is ankh, say ankh with me. Uja, senem, wonderful. You have just said life, strength for family members by giving them everlasting life, by giving them strength and giving them health. And so that is one of the things we have said and will need to continue to say. Because we are now at the place where it is going to be critically important for us. That's the kind of thing that you hear people say. And in fact, even people like us say that. And I must say that they've gotten it wrong. I beg to differ. In many ways, I am coming from the scene of the crime, the place where millions of us were stolen and forced to toil for hundreds of years, disconnecting us from our homeland. And I'm returning to the seat of civilization, the seat of humanity. That is what this journey is. That is what the return is. And so as I come back here, I know that there is so much about me, about us, that I have to learn, and that we have to learn. And so as I do this, I want to guide you in a don't bit make, of a meditation. Don't make this guy come. Intro I'm going to ask you to close your eyes in a minute. It's going to just be for you. with yourself. Recognize, acknowledge the images that come to mind when I say these words. Are you ready? Wonderful. Let's go. What do you see when I say the word doctor? What's the image that comes to mind? Where do they work? What do they look like? When you hear the word scientist, what image comes to mind? Who do you see? How do they look? How do they sound? Where do they absolutely spend their time? What are the images that come to mind? Who are the individuals that you think of? And finally, I want to say head of state. When I say head of state, I'm talking about somebody who is in control of everything. Head of state. What comes to mind? Who comes to mind? when you think of the term head of state. Okay, you can open your eyes. Now remember, this was just for you, right? This is just for you. And I've done these kinds of things with students in the United States, in other places. Let me say to you that often when I say those words, and I say them in rooms filled with people that are like us, Sometimes the students, even though they have not been prodded to tell us what they're thinking, they turn to me and say, when I hear a doctor, I find myself thinking of a European person. 
then I have to fix it in my head. Let me say to you, it is wonderful that at least they are trying to fix it. That that programming that we have received is something that can be unlearned. But we have to recognize the programming. Now, history students, I want to ask you a few questions about those things. When I say doctor, would you say might have been one of the world's earliest doctors? Does anyone have an answer for me? Is there a name that you think of as the first doctor? No names? I see students in the back talking, but they're afraid to actually give their answer. Tell us what you're thinking. They were like, this is the person he's thinking of. I saw that look, because I've had that look before. Let me say to you that when we think about doctors, it is irrefutable that the first doctors did their work in this land, in, on this continent. And in fact, some of you, let's see if you've heard of the name, I'm going to give a name that many of you might know if you've studied this. Some of you might have heard the name Imhotep. Let's see if, has anyone heard the name Imhotep? Let's see your hands. Come on, some of you are doing this. Come on, put your hand up. Let's see your hands. This means we have more work to do. That's what this means. But you should know that Imhotep was what we would often call a multi-genius. He was a doctor, he was an engineer, he was very similar to a vice chair of the state of Kemet. I'm going to talk about Kemet in a second. And so Imhotep was a very powerful person. It is believed that he wrote a medical journal that had over 200 cures to illnesses on the journal. In fact, when you go to the hospital today, if you say that you are ill, one of the first things they're going to do is they're going to check your vitals, right? Who's had their vitals checked? Maybe they'll check your pulse, your temp. Do you know that the first description of the pulse is something that Africans described? Imhotep calls it the tiny river that goes to and fro. And he says, check the, this tiny river to see if someone is gravely ill. Something that is done in hospitals all over the world. A process that you might think people understand it is our parents, our mothers and fathers that gave this to the world. And I don't want to only give you a name of a male doctor. Did you know that there were early female doctors? Who knew that? Who's heard of the name of Lady Possession? Please say Lady Possession with me. Lady Possession. Lady Possession. She is perhaps the earliest doc, one of the earliest doctors. She was a contemporary. She worked alongside in motel. She's one of the world's earliest doctors. A woman. A woman. You heard Dr. Anika Daniels Osaze talk about the fact that in ancient Africa we recognize the power of both men and women. And that is what we see. That is what we see. How about when I talk about scientists? Did anyone see people that look like themselves in this space? Did you see someone that looked like you? You can raise your hand if you did. No? I want you to think about the fact that the world's first scientists were African. In fact, I'm not going to go all the way back into the ancient world. I know right now I'm looking at students wearing masks right now because we are in the middle of a global pandemic. And I want to actually tell you really something that you might not know. Some people actually have seen that the place where I have traveled from, the United States, has had the worst pandemic of anyone else in the world. And so they've been talking about developing vaccines. Can I say something to you? There's thousands of people in Boston and because they had enslaved people, our ancestors who were enslaved, they didn't want to touch the bodies, right? They wouldn't touch those bodies. What did they do? They said, well, you're a slave. You have to take care of the bodies. Because we know that when we spend time with our relatives who have died, some of us contract smallpox. 
guess what happened? They began to realize that these enslaved Africans didn't get smallpox. So the man who owned a number of enslaved Africans, a man named Cotton Mather, don't say his name again because I do not care where he is. A man named Cotton Mather spoke to an enslaved African. An enslaved African whose name was Onesimus. Say Onesimus with me. Onesimus. We must say our ancestors' names in order for them to continue to live. Onesimus says, well, the reason y'all are dying is because you don't know what we do in West Africa. We take some of the material in the pustules, the bumps that people get. That's so we mix it together, we leave it in the sun so we know they won't harm someone. We make a small incision on someone's arm and we put it inside the arm. Those people will not get it. So that while we have companies that are valued at trillions of dollars creating these medicines, it was an enslaved African from Ghana that brought that science to the new world and gets absolutely no credit for it. This is not their science, it's our science. We were the world's first doctors and scientists. Let me just talk about a philosopher quickly and then I'll come to a, a close. Anyone have an idea what the world's first book is? The first book. Anybody want to make a guess? I want you to know, I know some of you probably thought I was going to say the Bible. Who, who said they were going to say the Bible? Somebody, somebody thought that, right? Come on now, somebody was thinking that. <laughs> I want you to know that there are sections of the Bible that come from an earlier text. A series of texts that Africans in this land called Kemet this land that unfortunately we know is Egypt today. These Africans wrote the world's first text. The earliest one is known as the Maxims of Patahotep. Please tell someone say Patahotep with me. Say the name. Patahotep. One of the world's earliest philosophers wrote the world's earliest complete book. And one of his compatriots, someone that really joined together, when we get all those things that we think we can say negative about each other, when we forget those things that people have said about us that have been keeping us apart, there is nothing that the African cannot do. And I'm not just being hopeful, I'm telling you that because there was nothing that this world benefits from today that we didn't do over the world get together with our brothers and sisters who are on the continent we will once more be the most powerful people in the world and as i look at a wonderful group of beautiful intelligent historians who are budding who are learning i know that these stories are stories that you can tell to our children so they understand who they are. So when they look in the mirror, they see the creators of civilization. And as we understand who we are, we will once more be at the forefront of human civilization. As I say goodbye to you, here's a phrase I'd like to give you. I want to say that when someone is leaving someone they care about, in the ancient world, they would have said, Shem Amhotep. Say Shem Amhotep with me. It means go forth in peace. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful life. And those are all things that I want for you, that I plead for you, because your work will solidify the work of our people for thousands and thousands of years. Thank you very much, my brother, Mr. Jabari Osazi, the high priest at the Mahat Sir Time, Harlem, New York, USA. Thank you, thank you.
We can't wait to have a strong year in Kyrgyz. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can you give him a better round of applause? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we will now invite the president of the Global African Chamber of Commerce, who also happens to be the finance director for ADDI, Africa Diaspora Development Institute. ADDI is building the very first smart city in West Africa. We hope that this smart city will become a model, will become a guide for all Africa to look to into the future, to build cities like that, because we've done that in the past. And uh, this man I'm talking about is the one leading the finances aspect. The battery is my very brother, low. Yes. Give me a signal. Give me a signal, guys. Olivier, this is your audience. Is that a anymore? No. It's not, I think the, it's also low. Okay. So, should I go? Okay. Centered 
of excellence designed to train and build the international capacity needed to, to build Africa through the reversal of the brain draining out of Africa. Due to massive exodus of Africans workforce through the brain drain that has occurred over the past 400 years, the plan is to start the development of each African region through the building of an African diaspora center of excellence called Wakanda Smart Cities. This Wakanda Smart City will be built across the continent of Africa for training and the building the needed intellectual capacity, starting with the Wakanda City of Return in Cape Coast, Ghana, located in the West African region, in the West Ghana region. For the development and implementation, the project has secured around 35,000 acres of land divided into Wakanda sites in Asebu, Pamankese, and Asebu, Apewosika, and across coastal uh, area <laughs> on the ocean. The proposed investments aim at building a smart city ecosystem that focuses that focuses on training, intellectual capacity, building hotels, establishing an agricultural program and the facility, pre-constructions, improving current infrastructure, and the building the new infrastructures in partnership with the, the city of Cape Coast, the government of Uganda, Cape Coast University, Cape Coast Technical College, Cape Coast Marine Academy, Cape Coast Nursing and the Hospital, building shopping centers and the construction of the African diaspora residential village and many more. My dear sisters and brothers, I have to thank you because this year and on January 4th and 5th, a team of ADDI that have been privileged to lead comprised of engineers, investment bankers, lawyers, came to Cape Coast to identify the needs to make sure what financial and technical needs you have. Make sure we open our first new office of ADDI, hire local team, and the most importantly, most importantly, link with our Ghanaian brothers and sisters. When the team came back to the US and the UK, reported back to ADDI leadership. Today, my dear brother and sister, I can report back to you that the African diaspora has been able to raise the important seed money needed to be able to raise the important seed money needed to really have a necessary funds we need to build Wakanda City of Return of Cape Coast. We are today in a position to start implementing the Wakanda City of Return Cape Coast uh, region. We, diaspora, and also our technical team on ground is busy working to implement the Wakanda City of Return and I'm pleased also to let you know the funds will be available in the few months to make sure we hire massive workforce in Cape Coast, also across Ghana, to make sure the dream of a Wakanda movie becomes a reality. You can see, touch, enjoy, and have a legacy of Africans. The Wakanda City of Return of Cape Coast will become a model that will be duplicated everywhere on the continent of Africa. I can tell you other countries have right now started reaching out to us to say, ask us to implement the same model, the Ghanaian or Cape Coast model, across the continent of Africa. We have currently the two countries that also are really interested to start Wakanda City, uh, smart cities in their respective countries. We call upon you. This cannot be achieved without the people of Ghana. I have to give you a big thanks 
for receiving us when we were there in January. We met several people, key stakeholders, the Cape Coast University, uh, especially the uh, people uh, from the kingdom of Asebo Kingdom uh, who facilitated, who hosted us. Now we can say we are very truly connected. Diaspora is now connected with the end people. We are ready to work with you. We can tell you what happened in a few weeks ago. Has never happened before in the diaspora. This is what happened. Within two days, the diaspora has been able to raise money. Raise money that has never been raised before. So we can tell you right now, we have money. We are ready to come to build Wakanda City of Return, the first project that will be a model for the many or the rest of African uh, continent. We in the diaspora, we have a capacity in terms of uh, technical resources, also financial resources to build Africa. But it's not enough if we don't connect. As you know, one finger cannot lift much, but five fingers can lift a whole village. If we work together, we achieve what our fathers, founding fathers, have always been to do. Dr. Arikadachi Wambori Kwao and His Majesty Nana Obokese, this initiative of Wakanda City of Return is a reality today. Once again, thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Brother Olivier Kamanzi. We appreciate you, we honor you. Thank you, thank you for inspiring us. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give you a better round of applause. So now, to all the different campuses, the Wakanda City is happening. It's real. I personally went to the house of uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Shembar Kwao in August last year, uh, somewhere in Tennessee, USA. I spent three days and uh, we spoke about this, we prayed about this, and uh, we decided to move forward with this. I invited them to come, and they are coming. After our deliberations, I can tell you, we called uh, Ralph Henderson of Urban Magazine, the CEO of Urban Magazine. And then he passed it, he passed it on to people like Eddie Murphy and all the celebrities, all our big people in the US, the diaspora, they are applied their support. And the Excellency Ambassador of the Power has led this, you know, I can tell you, monies have been raised for this project to start. Also, uh, something very beautiful is going to happen. There's a young guy who built a car by himself. His name is Calvin. Yes, uh, somehow he's gotten to ADI. And uh, we are in the process of raising money to build a car assembly plant right at Aproma Asimu. This is how it's going to happen. It's not like many three years old. You, know, you will see this since beginning from August. The Opias University of Excellence is going to host this uh, plant. And uh, we also have an, uh, an agreement with Cape Coast and Kai University. We start an, uh, a farm there, 30 acre farm greenhouse. You know, we are looking to start models, to start stuff that will change the way we think, the way we do things, stuff that will take us to where we used to be to move us forward. I'm also happy to announce that Agri Memorial is going to see a lot of help from ADA. The Black and The Black and White. The Black and White. The Black and White. The Black and White. And uh, we plan everything. Now you have the very first ADDI club, Campus Club. Give yourself a round of applause. 
my three members of this very wonderful club, you are representing Her Excellency Ambassador Chahori Pao at your various schools, at your various communities. So what she stands for is what you have to preach. We have to be honest to ourselves. Her Excellency has given more to Africa than any other human being I know right now. She has sacrificed for us. And, uh, you know, it's difficult to always tell the truth. I see some by the truth. So as young people, you have to know that you always stand by the truth. No matter how difficult it is, it is clear. If you are a member of the ADA club at Agri, you are a member of the truth society. So stand by the truth all the time. Ladies and gentlemen, I know a lot has been said, a lot has been done here. We've seen wonderful dances. We've uh, had wonderful speeches. Uh, it is now time to hear from our special guest of honor to give us a closing remark and then uh, we will have uh, refreshments. The students will have to go so they will send you packs. And I can promise you the food is very good. I tried it. <laughs> so, with a round of applause, let's welcome Nana Kojo Iguapa, the Akamonian of Adnan Tanzania. Thank you, Nana Obakasi. Uh, all too soon, we have come to the end of the program. And uh, it's been a wonderful evening. We have heard from speakers like uh, Rabbi Kahay explaining what the return is all about. And we have also heard from the chief priest and the priestess about cabbage and what it also stands for. It's been a wonderful evening, as I said earlier on. And uh, I want to thank everybody here, especially those at the high table, uh, for sitting in this uh, program. But also not forgetting the students that came all the way from Agri and they've uh, been here with us. I want to thank all of you for making time for this uh, this uh, afternoon's program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's important for you to acknowledge all of our great Amosa people who have been here with us throughout. Nepal's of Mr. Hiram Anderson, CEO owner of Highland Court Hotel Mr. Anderson. Also, the fabulous Honorable Naomi Ajay Kunedu, Assembly Woman, Upper State Hatran Area. Also, we have with us this man who is trying to eliminate poverty from Central Region. Honorable Obed Arokansa, CEO, Quenza de Lord of And also the leader of uh, Asusi Dance Institute, Nana Bakan, and uh, Andra Tusiao, if you are here. So there's a lot. And now to the most important person here today. You know who that person is? It is you. Give us a round of applause. Some music whilst food is served, and then uh, we call it a day. God bless you for coming. This is your home. Bye bye, Rita. Thank you very much. Madam Hamish, thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. And it's a good to be a barrier. Thank you. Another man in Kosovo. Thank you. 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 Thank you